I'm really, really happy this morning to be joined for the first time on Locked and Loaded by Mr. Tony Gosling. And just to give you a little flavor of Tony is or who he is and what he's about, he describes himself on his social media platform as a Jesus follower, an investigative journalist. He's ex-BBC. He's a digger. He's a Bilderberg historian, a social justice editor, and he writes books on World War II and the occult. And he also runs a forum called 911forum.org.com. UK. Without any further ado, welcome to Locked and Loaded, Tony Gosling. How are you doing this fine Friday morning? Oh, <clears throat> hi, Rick. Yeah, uh, it's a, norm, a bit early for me. <laughs> it's like, uh, I had a bit of a wild night last night. Bristol oh. um, has got its own kind of version of Private Eye. And, mm. and uh, yeah, so that was a very interesting evening. I mean, this this if people are always scratching around wondering, well, what can I do to change things? Start up a little private eye in your own town, your own city. These these guys are brilliant. I mean, it's mostly guys. It wasn't, you know, it, it's, there was one woman um, around the eight, the eight editors around the table. But the thing is, because it's a private eye style thing, the main, uh, you know, as a, a job I've been 35 years in journalism. <clears throat> and what we journalists like is we like humour. Uh, most of the mainstream press, of course, and also the so-called alternative, a lot of it press, is boring <clears throat> it's got very little wit and humor in the writing and this is one thing you can't say not say about the bristolian uh, so you'll find it online as well bristolian.net but we just love picking up a copy once a month it's only four pages but it's a brilliant scandal sheet about everything that's going on behind the scenes in the city and their famous front page from a couple of months ago after the mps in bristol uh, refused to communicate with the families of the uh, police victims in the Kill the Bill demonstration, where, who have, some of whom have been charged with riot for kicking a policeman's shield as the as the policeman is running at them, uh, and and done mass uh, and some of them doing massive long sentences. None of the local MPs, the four Labour MPs, uh, would communicate with the families and support the the uh, this uh, campaign to overturn this miscarriage of justice they had a picture of the four faces of these four mps and across the top the faces of evil <laughs> so this is our four mps in bristol so those are the people i was spending the evening with last night and it was a terrific evening so sorry if i'm a little bit slow Oh no, no, it's all good. In fact, what you've just said, strangely enough, uh, you 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 weren't you wouldn't have been listening to the content of the show for the last uh, two hours. Uh, but we had a like a humorous award ceremony for the year end uh, in the first hour of the show here this morning with my co uh, presenter Natalie Chill. And one of the things that we try and do is the vast majority of the content that we have here is deadly serious, dealing with geopolitical events all around the world. But yet, I believe that without humor. At this time, uh, it would be too overwhelming and we'd be completely bogged down in this cesspit of corruption and scandal that's enveloping everywhere. So I take on board and I'm glad to hear you say it as well, somebody with so much experience in journalism. I think you need a healthy dose of cynical humor, maybe a little bit of black humor as well, just to keep us well, going definitely. through this. Because if this is your bread and <clears throat> well, butter... Well, it's satire. And you, you, it's satire. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh... Um, the satire is actually a sign of a healthy democracy. If you've got, in fact, funnily enough, even after the English Civil War, uh, when we had the restoration with Charles II, he opened up the the, uh, the whole scene in London, the theatre scene, for satire. So he used to sit there guffawing <coughs> jokes about himself uh, in the London theatres. Uh, and, of course, that's what we need with King Charles, particularly with the fact that he was involved in the murder of his wife i mean i don't think he did it himself but poor old diana didn't stand a chance with uh, charlie's establishment after her yeah. and uh, someone like this who's sort of supposedly going to lead the country uh, these are the people that satire needs to be aimed at and uh, you know th this is why I it's so sad when i was growing up we had loads of satire all over british television radio uh, and now Private Eye even has been kind of taken over. It's a very much a limited hangout. So it's why it's so lovely to have uh, scandal sheets like our uh, mm. uh, our Bristolian. Uh, it, it honestly mm. makes life worth living when you can see that there's somebody out there who's got the guts to publish the truth mm. and, and to poke fun at our so-called leaders who are making such a pig's ear of it all. 
Mm-hmm. And it's good also as well uh, to hang hang out, uh, not in an echo chamber way, but it's good to associate Correct. and hang out and bounce Correct. off like-minded uh, individuals <clears throat> as well. Because uh, just again, before you came on, my last guest, uh, Dr. Bruce Scott, he's a, a psychoanalyst, a mental health expert, and we were talking about dealing with PTSD, and it's important to seek out groups of people that maybe have been through what you have been through to get that real empathetic support. And it's the same, I suppose, with uh, journalism. I mean, like, you can't go and hang around with a bunch of mainstream hacks. They're going to look at you, label you a tinfoil hatter and so on and so forth. Not really inspire you, but crush you and try and uh, cancel you in, in today's terminology. But when you can actually well, start Well, not necessarily. Look, no, hang on, because in real journalism, you'll find newsrooms are split generally between people yeah. who are realize just how bad things are but are keeping their heads down and trying to keep their jobs Mm. and others who are Mm -hmm. believers you know in the bs so uh you know uh, for example in our local paper we've got four or five we know i know four or five individual journalists who do realize how terrible things are in fact if you sit down the pub and have a chat about conspiracies with them Mm. they're absolutely up up for it and they see the Mm. results of this I mean, it's, it's a bit like if, you know, in the old days, I, I worked for the BBC a long, long time ago. Mm-hmm. You used to get the cameramen who were there all the time through when uh, big top cabinet ministers and stuff were being filmed. And they'd see what they were like, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, so a lot of people in the press, in, in the media, are even in the mass media, are, are very much aware that things are not, very good not right and the lovely thing about the bristolian i'm sorry to keep going on about them mm-hmm. but the bristolian lot is uh and i was saying i was chatting with them and saying well i'm really disappointed you haven't been uh you know uh taking the mickey out of me because i consider mm-hmm. i would consider it uh an honor to have them write some sort of terrible piece about how dreadful my podcast was and you know what idiot i was because that is actually if you if you if you ever spent time in the mass media what you find is loads and loads of backslapping it's vile it's sycophancy mm. and uh, that's mm. the bubble we need to burst if we're going to actually yeah. have a healthy media yeah, good point that you make there as well about uh, awareness, but because of maybe wanting to retain a job, obviously bills to pay, you know, people are aware of what's going on, but they keep shooting other people just uh, to the company line. I think that's what we saw as well. There's no way in the medical profession that doctors, for example, can actually believe in the efficacy of these dumb face masks or social distancing or constant hand washing or washing your shopping and even you know the safety and effectiveness of the jabs but because they were threatened or they were uh, threatened with losing their jobs and they probably had huge mortgages and kids in private school and you know cars to pay off they kept quiet even though they knew what time it was is there not that element though of uh, fear of retribution loss in your job loss in your position and statue that does keep people silent does keep people in their places at the minute and that's one of the reasons why we're in the the, the mess that we're in societally. Well, look, I mean, one of the main take homes from the pandemic is that many people have not become doctors because they want to heal people. They've become become mm-hmm. doctors because it's a very well paid profession, and they they're actually focused on uh, you know making a career, getting up the up the greasy pole. Just as in journalism, I mean, in many professions, you know, you'll find people. Who, who are actually dedicated to the public service angle of it, but others who are just interested in climbing the greasy pole. And that's something that it's really taught me. I mean, you've got, you've got so many doctors out there who are prescribing things that, well, they are just turning a blind eye to the damage that whatever it is is doing to the patient. Mm-hmm. Yeah, turning a blind eye and, you know, money has a great way of doing that. You think of the amount of money that those GPs were making jabbing people uh, during the t- three years ago. It was actually the first jobs were unleashed upon the public in the UK. I think it was December 2020. Hard to believe that was three years ago, but they were getting, what, 10, 12 quid per shot, putting uh, needles in people's arms. And then when they ruled out the campaigns to under 15s, we're getting 25 quid. There was an incentive to jab younger people there too. So that blinds everything and, this, the, you know, do no harm shall be the first tenant you know if they yeah if well they i wonder if, if if they were yeah. jabbing themselves you know mm. I, I often also i think is there was a lot of um if you want to uh, talk about this a bit the uh, look at the royal family i mean these uh camilla and charles are very much in the sort of inner circle of the sort of what i would describe as a fourth reich really which mm. is a kind of financial empire a globalist empire attempting to control 
uh, the world. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing their best to start a war, which they think they can control the outcome of, et cetera, around the world. They're obviously doing these hostile takeover bids. They're, uh, you know, big corporations are. Mm. Uh, and you look at Charles and Camilla, they're both now in this thing, the Order of the Garter, which is uh, also now got Tony Blair in it. And I, mm. I look at that as actually the key part of the establishment now, after, after many years looking at what is the establishment. This, you know, based in Windsor Castle, it's the oldest order of chivalry. Uh, or, uh, in, uh, it could be in, on the planet, actually, certainly in Europe, uh, obviously in the mm. States as well, goes back to not long after the extinguishing of the Knights Templar. Uh, and the, then, then you look at uh, at um, the Duke of Edinburgh and the Queen. Well, they all had their jabs, uh, but which ones were? Pl- I would suggest that uh, the the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh probably got real jabs, thinking that this was safe or it was the right thing to do, and that they, as leaders of the country, should show the way. Uh, whereas Charles and Camilla st- sneakily were probably just having some sort of placebo stuck into them. But, I mean, I've got no real evidence for that, just the sort of circumstantial, who are these people, what is their history, uh, because, uh, you know, Charles is very much involved in all this pol- very highly political attempt to, uh, uh, you know, get get the zero carbon. And, of course, at the, in the Panama Papers, many people forget this, it was revealed that he had set up the main... Uh, the main carbon trading companies, and he personally is going to benefit from it all. So, uh, so there you go. Uh, interesting, you mentioned Blur there on the, the Order of the Garter. You mentioned that he was indoctrinated into that, uh, you know, a few years ago by the Queen when she was still alive. Isn't it strange? Don't you think at this time you see Blur? Uh, has been potentially he's going to be dispatched over to Israel to talk to Netanyahu apparently uh, about brokering a peace deal there he, he got a job as a PC envoy to the Middle East when he uh, ceased to become the Prime Minister of Britain even though you know he was responsible for lies based on weapons of mass destruction the death of so many Iraqis David Cameron recently made his uh, return to the political stage even though he's unelected he received a peerage from Charles as well so as he could take up his new minister position don't you find it odd and weird that at this time these ex-british prime ministers are they've never went too far the apple did never really fell too far from the tree but you find it interesting that they're starting to almost rise to prominent positions again after they've uh, long exited the political stage left well no because we're, we're what we're witnessing is a total <clears throat> a total destruction of democracy really mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. uh and a clique reasserting itself uh, so it's quite understandable that uh, Cameron. I mean, it, it was interesting to watch. It was the um, Sunday uh, Remembrance Sunday service in the cenotaph the day after the massive Palestine demonstration with three quarters of a million people on London streets. They have this ceremony every year, Remembrance Sunday, uh, and at the end of the service, Charles uh, walks into the Foreign Office, which is directly the big door next to the cenotaph, for lunch uh, with Cameron and Sunak. Right. So and the next morning is a surprise announcement. Oh, I'm surprised there were no leaks about this. Well, they just decided, hadn't they? Charles has told Sunak, I want this boy to be our um, our foreign secretary. And uh, so Charles is very much running in this as a sort of medieval style king. I think it's pretty obvious. Sunak is just doing what he's told. He's a Goldman Sachs boy. He knows what side his bread is buttered. Uh, mm-hmm. And actually, with Blair going to the Middle East, uh, well, what have we got there? We've got an Armageddonist. I mean, we did a, um, we did a. Uh, well, I'm just trying to think exactly. This is a few years ago, looking at, at Blair's Masonic history, mm-hmm. uh, because I think it was Chris Everard did had done a bit of digging on his lodge numbers, went mm-hmm. to have a look where his lodge was. Well, it's Duke Street, St James, right in the central centre of London, and I was stood out there with a Russian film crew doing a, an interview about the Freemasons. And these two guys turned up with trays of sandwiches to try and come in. We were stood in the doorway and they said, oh, excuse me, can we get to the doorway? And, and I thought, well, let's just ask them a question before the, before we let them in. And I said, so what, uh, which br- branch of Freemasonry is this? And he said, oh, it's the Rosicrucians. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Blair is a Rosicrucian. Okay, so they're Armageddonists. They're accelerationists. And if anybody hasn't got up to speed with Armageddon, uh, sorry, <laughs> accelerationism, then, you know, basically you're, you're falling away at like the, the stage two of a rocket engine and you're not going, you know, uh, forward. 
And uh, yeah, because because that's what they are. They're accelerationists. They're trying to uh, precipitate uh, a cataclysmic third world war, what they call Armageddon. And uh, that's what they're actually trying to do. And this is this is the one thing, of course, that none of these mainstream journalists will dare think is that someone is out there crazy enough to try and start a third world war. Well, as we know, we've already had two world wars. They started those. Mm -hmm. And it's this mm -hmm. generation. Now we've got most of the people who can remember World War Two are dead and not with us anymore. It's time to have another one. So the billionaires, uh, this is what many of them are up to. You know, they they believe that they can uh, uh, bring about order from chaos. This is Naomi Klein's yep. shock doctrine. Uh, and so uh, I guess I think that's where we are. By the way, I do do a weekly podcast, which is thisweek.org.uk. Yep. We've got a Christmas special with an interview from Bethlehem, too, about uh, what's going on at the West Bank. Uh, I couldn't I get through to my Gaza correspondent, but uh, we managed to get through to Bethlehem. I was going to say, Tony, uh, about the best place to, to listen into the content because we're, we're right up to time here now, which is unfortunate. It's been great talking to you, no doubt. Uh, we'll get talking again, Mr. Tony Gosling. Check out thisweek.org.uk for this week's relevant yeah, and podcast. And have, a, have a quick look yep, at yep. Uh, Tony Greenstein yep. and, and what's happened to him. He's been arrested yep. for supporting Hamas, supposedly. Will do, will do. But we've got to call it time here right now. We're coming right up to the break. So massive thanks to you, Tony. And uh, Merry Christmas to everyone out there. Have a great new year, Tony, as well. And everybody listening in. Murray, guys in the studio, TNT listeners, have an epic one. I'll be back in the 1st of January. Don't